Alrighty, so we're going to be talking about 5.4 and 5.5 today. Both of them are going to focus on cognitive learning and the different aspects of that. So cognitive learning, different than associative learning, because we're not forming clear associations. We're not, it's not risk and reward oriented. It's not based on automatic bodily functions. Um, these are things that are happening in our head, which is something that early behaviorists more or less ignore. They said cognitive psychology is too muddy, too unclear. And so learning happens outside of cognitively. It's happening more physically. So we're focusing now on cognitive sides of learning. So we're going to talk about latent insight, observational, and learned helplessness. Okay, so starting um, with latent. But real quick, the cognition, um, we, as I said, the early behaviorists like Skinner and Pavlov and Watson, they all completely ignored this, right? They, they thought that things like emotions and memories and thoughts and motivations, um, they had nothing to do with it. They were really trying to move away from Freudian versions of psychology. They thought that that was not scientific enough, and, and many would agree. Um, but in modern times, as we've, we've more and more began to recognize the impacts of cognitive functioning, um, we've re realized that, that they ab it absolutely is a portion of learning, right? The way that we think about things and things that can happen just in our brain and not exactly in the physical world. So um, cognitive versions of learning um, have been you know, theorized in modern times with help of things like PET scans um, and EEGs, but also even before that. So for instance, um, latent learning. Uh, this is just this expectate, this understanding that we pick up things all the time without any rewards, without any form of reinforcer, um, without any form of um, stimulus. We we learn things. For instance, our environment. We are our bodies, our brains are constantly learning our environments basically, right under the surface, subconsciously. We're not thinking about where we are. But if you go back to a place you're familiar with, even if you weren't you know, didn't need a reward, you, you, you were still learning that. And that was proven with rats, rats who had never been in a maze before. They didn't know that mazes had rewards in them. And so they just let them out. Um, a rat just kind of wander around a maze aimlessly. And the early behaviors would have guessed, oh, the rat's not going to do anything. It's just going to wander the maze. And it did it just wander the maze. Um, and they let it do that for a couple of days. Um, it had no reason to memorize the maze. It had no reason to learn anything about the maze. But they found that rats then who had been in that maze um, were able to get to the center quicker um, than rats that, you know, still had um, still knew or the, where that it stood that. Sorry. They were able to get to the center quicker than rats who had not been in there, but knew that mazes often had food. So uh, just being in that area, they were learning things latently. They were picking up the information, the spatial understanding of the different parts of that maze, even though they had never been rewarded. They didn't know there was a reason. There was no food for them to get. They just wandered the maze aimlessly. And then eventually when food was added, they were faster than any other versions of rats who had not been in the maze. Early behaviors would have said, no, they weren't learning the maze at all. They weren't, won't learn those things. So latent learning is one. Two is insight learning. Um, this is uh, this is kind of challenging that idea uh, that all behaviors are shaped that we slowly work our way to towards things with trial and error. And uh, Wolfgang Kohler uh, showed th with chimpanzees this idea of insight, um, and he would always d do things like placing a banana outside of a caged chimpanzee's reach, and he wanted to see if they could figure out how to get that. And early behaviorists, operational behaviorists, um, who believed in operational conditioning, would have said that the the chimpanzees would have needed some form of reward. They they weren't just going to walk up and um, you know, figure out a way on their own. They're not going to just figure out how to get that banana. They would need trial and error to do that. Um, and unlike Skinner's rats or his pigeons, the chimpanzees showed that they had just like aha moments, um, right? They didn't, they weren't slowly figuring out how to get that. They would sit there and stare at it for a while and think about it and then eventually figure out the problem, right? How do we solve any logical problems? Um, we can do it with trial and error, sure, but we can also sit back and think about it. And he showed that chimpanzees often did that. They would have an aha moment of a large stick that they found on the other side of the yard and they'd go over and knock the banana down with. Or 
famously, they found like large boxes and worked together. This is just out of nowhere. It wasn't trial and error or anything like that. They just all of a sudden understand something. And I feel like we've all probably had that at some point. Think about a joke that someone tells you or a logic problem or a riddle. And then uh, you're like, ah, just you don't you don't trial and error your way to that. Um, oftentimes you forget about it. And a couple days later, you're like, I got it. Now I know why blank rabbit crossed the road or something like that. Um, so a couple other forms of latent learning we should think about uh, when we talk about learned helplessness. Um, this is kind of this deals is is almost a form of like uh, of therapy is is oftentimes what psychologists are thinking about these. Um, but internal and external locus of control. This is cognitive psychology because it's how we perceive the world around us and whether or not we have control over our lives. Um, and that cognitive, just the process of thinking, I, I am able to change this or I am not able to change this, changes how we learn to cope with problems. And so um, we can learn to do that through problem-focused or emotion-focused coping, known as either internal or external locus of control. Internal locus of control um, is this problem-focused coping. Um, it means that you feel in control of your own life. And when you see a problem, you're thinking, okay, this is a problem, but I have the power to fix this. I'm going to think through what I need to do to fix this. Um, external locus of control, more emotional coping is going to um, think more about like, I'm not, I don't know how to fix anything. I don't know how to fix this problem. So I'm going to avoid any problems. I'm going to avoid things because I can't handle it in some ways. You'll try to get someone else to do something for you. You try to get somebody else to help you. You'll look toward things like drugs and alcohol to get over it. So this um, external locus of control says it's not in my control. So I'm just going to place it on someone else. And these are processes of thought, cognitive learning, cognitive processes, right? Um, and so what came out of this from uh, Martin Seligman is this idea of learned helplessness. Now, this was a while back. I ethically, highly doubt this would have passed anymore, um, but he took dogs and strapped them down to a, to a floor where the shocks were. He taught them where the shocks and where no shocks were, um, and then connected them to the floor so that there wasn't much they could do about it. Um, they weren't able to get off of the shock floor and then shocked them repeatedly. Very sad, right? Um, definitely probably wouldn't be ethical today. Um, but eventually he learned that the longer he helped the dog without the ability to change their surroundings, um, he would shock them repeatedly. And then whenever he removed the restraints, um, the dog did nothing. It continued to get shocked continued it to get shocked and it had developed that external locus of control. Um, it no longer felt in control of its own life in any way. And so when bad things were happening, it wasn't doing anything to try to get away from it. It didn't think that it had any power. It was just praying that someone else, the person that was shocking him would just stop. That was all that it could do. And so if more and more things are terrible happen to us and we more and more feel that we don't have any lack of control, we get this learned helplessness. This learned helplessness is a full hopelessness, right? It's complete resignation that we don't have the ability um, to change things in our own life. And this is a really dangerous mental state to be in, right? You're not just going to be more likely towards drugs, alcohol, self-harm, but also, you know, this is actual health, right? Actual health is going to be worse, right? Our immune system suffers. We don't sleep as well. Our stress is higher. All of these things are bad outcomes. Um, and so uh, internal and external locus control are not genetic. They're cognitive. They're things that we can train. And so when we're talking about things like cognitive behavioral therapy, a lot of times what they're focused on is training us into this internal locus of control, problem focused to think about things and not think, oh, I can't control that, but focus on the things we can control. Focus on the things in our lives that we do have the ability to shift. And that leads to good vibes, right? That leads and makes people much happier. Finally, the last thing I'm talking about is that observational forms of learning. Observational learning, we talked about a little bit before, um, but Albert Bandura's Bobo doll experiment, where famously kids sat there um, or in a room of toys and they watched as an adult walked walked in and either like did nothing or gently uh, played with or really aggressively played with this like blow up clown 
Um, and then the observer would watch what the kids did. And most of the time, the kids did what the adults did. Um, if the adults punched and threw the clown, the kids were like, oh, cool, that'll be awesome. That's what I'll do to the clown. Um, and so, yeah, we've got like little kids swinging hammers at this clown, sitting on it, punching it repeatedly, throwing it across the room. Um, and most of the time, it was like 80% of the time, kids would mimic the aggressive behavior of adults. And so we do this both pro and anti-social behavior behavior, right? We watch other kids do things um, and we often want to do that as well, right? When most, when all the other kids in the room are sitting quietly, um, it's rare that a kid walks in and is like, I'm going to yell really loud and cause problems. Uh, most students, most people are going to watch a group of people and mimic them in some way. That mimicry, that pro-social observational learning, right? You didn't through ob uh, operational learning, um, figure out rewards for being quiet. That's one way you do it. But there's also observational. You cognitively think about like, hey, everyone else is doing this. I should be, be doing this. Um, and then we can also learn antisocial behavior sometimes, right? We can watch other kids in a classroom be bad um, and think, hey, that's, that's what I'm going to do too. I'm going to act like that. We think that we're supposed to act like that in some way. Think about middle school um, and how... Uh, all, I feel like this is a universal experience of middle school, but um, right, middle schoolers, especially middle school boys, you watch others and you uh, think, oh, it's like everybody else is acting up and you know speaking out and kind of making fun of the teacher or something like that, being difficult in general. It's like I guess I should do that too. Um, and so that antisocial behavior, kind of aggressive behavior or mean behavior, can happen because of observational forms of learning, right? And a lot of this is traced back to um, something that humans have, monkeys have, um, dogs show a little bit of this, More, most advanced mammals have a version of this, humans just have the most active versions of this. And some, some believe that this is one of the things that makes, that has given humans such a rapid advantage, um, is that we are able to mimic at this incredible level, right? We watch others and we mimic them. Um, sometimes even to our own fault, but that allows us to reproduce successful behavior quickly. We don't have to wait on evolution to um, to get good and beneficial behavior. We can just do it through observational learning as well. So mirror neurons um, are those neurons that do nothing but activate when they watch other people do things. Right? We get um, our mirror neurons activate when we're watching people play sports that we like, um, when even more like playing a video game that we like, but they also activate um, watching someone do a task. And then when we're given the chance to do that task, it helps us learn how to do things. So observational learning is traced back to this, um, right? And the things like behaviors and emotions are, can be contagious because of uh, mirror neurons. When we, when we yawn because our friend yawns, those are mirror neurons acting up in some way. Um, so applications here are that pro-social and anti-social behavior, as we said, pro-social is that, um, you know, we train people into good behavior. Um, right, nonviolent protests and civil disobedience is based in this observational pro-social behavior. Right, um, right. Think of the images of um, civil rights activists in the 1960s and 70s. Right, who were the people that were behaving badly? It wasn't the civil rights activists. It was the you know the the policemen with their dogs attacking the civil rights activists. It was the people on the streets um, that were protesting against them, throwing things, holding signs, and yelling at them. Right, the kind people, the pro-social behavior um, were those that were protesting. And so that was, that's kind of the theory of pro-social uh, observational learning, um, nonviolent protesting of MLK, Gandhi, others, um, anti-social behavior. Um, we can get more things like aggressiveness. Um, there's all kinds of studies that show that the more aggressive television and movies kids watch, they will mimic that, right? Like um, think about the impacts of wrestling. I don't feel like your old generation that was is nearly as into like WWE. Um, I guess MMA is bigger though. But as a whole, like when I was younger, everybody was watching wrestling. And so everybody would go over to other people's houses and we'd all mimic that in some way. We'd get on the trampoline and try to do crazy wrestling moves. And a lot of people got really hurt. Um, so that aggressive behavior um, comes from mimicry, right? If we don't watch people be aggressive, we, we may get aggressive when we're threatened. But as a whole, that aggressiveness is a little bit um, genetic, but it's also trained. It's also observationally learned in some way. So we imitate and humans oft, often over imitate, not just imitate, we over imitate. 
Um, that's shown over and over again, that when we watch people do things, we will mimic it perfectly, even if there's no reason to do it perfectly. We, we tend to mimic exactly as others do, and that's both a good thing and a bad thing. Okay? So that's it for uh, learning the entire unit, 5.4 and 5.5. We've gone over the first couple as well. So um, hopefully you get the gist of that now. should be working on EQ guides and vocab. And we are moving into our next unit soon. Much love.